at Iowa State for a number of years and uh, faculty in their animal science department uh, before that as well. I'm originally from South Dakota and we're very fortunate to have him here today to talk a little bit about uh, some of the international collaborations he's done and, and benefits from that. So yeah. take it away. Thank you, Chris. Um, so in terms of where the talk, I mean, ask questions at any time, I'm happy to lead you. Uh, in terms of going forward. Uh, and this is a little bit different talk and that, yeah, there's science in here, but really the messages for this really are the non-science uh, things that are going forward. So as a society in the world, we have some grand challenges in which it is that we need to try to address uh, going forward. And they're ones where as individuals, we're not gonna be able to solve these problems. Global food security, one of those that very much in terms of one that you have to do. And we now have new players in this arena that we have the potential to work with. So one of the agencies in the US that is really interesting in it, but is different than what you think, is the Department of Defense. They are getting very interested in this because when you do not have people who are hungry, they tend to be a little bit more sedate. Um, also, here's a fairly large number. What do you think this number is supposed to represent in the world? Just throw out a weird idea. Tons of food. Tons of food, okay. Great idea, but not quite. So we're not moving on food at this point. Anybody else? Acres of land used. Oh, acres of land. You know what? I never even looked at that one. Could be. Uh, but uh, 2.4 trillion, in this case, metric tons, is how much carbon has been emitted into the atmosphere in the last 200 years. Today, oops, hold on. There's still 950 million metric tons that are in the atmosphere. So trees, uh, the oceans, and other things have removed a lot of the carbon. So we do have somewhat of a circular carbon economy in the world, but we still have an awfully large number that we have to overcome. And how it is that we're going to do that is not something that just an individual but through collaborations and working internationally, I think we have the opportunity to try to address. And why do I say that? Because you can go and look at what it is that has happened for the ozone layer in the last 20 years, where it is, in essence, able to have repaired itself. Here, either just has or very shortly will have done that. And by simply removing uh, CFCs from many of the things in which it is that we do as society. So I truly believe that this is something that is an opportunity for us going forward. And it's actually, I was talking to Chris a little bit earlier, this problem is now the single largest project I've ever been named on in terms of dollars, that it is a $1.25 billion project that we're waiting on for the Department of Energy to say whether or not they funded it or not. And if you'd have told me that I'd been on a project that big in my life, I'd have laughed at you really up until about a year ago. The other is look at the UN, UN sustainability goals. There is nothing up there that our individual research labs are going to solve alone. We need to work together as larger international communities. One of the things that what you're trying to talk about here is what are the benefits in terms of doing that, but also what are some of the challenges associated with that? So I have to thank two individuals in my career that have opened phenomenal numbers of doors for me. Sue Lamont uh, was one of my original mentors. Uh, when I entered uh, the university, now back in, 19, in February 1999, um, one day I had been contacted by someone internationally wanting to come visit the lab and get some training. And it's like, all right. I've never been in a lab other than for my PhD, where we had a visitor from Russia at that time. I can tell you some interesting stories about living in Russia because of working in Russia. 
But ask Sue, it's like, is this something I should do as a young assistant professor? And she's like, well, what do they want to do when we talk through it at the end of the day? It was like, sure, let's go through this. And then Max Rothschild uh, over on the other side uh, started really helping to open doors internationally as in travel from the United States in order to start to work with people internationally. And it's by having them just simply introducing me to someone else in terms of good that has made all of the difference in the world. Because how do you walk up to, in essence, someone who has won the Wolf Prize for science and say, I would like to work with you, when all of a sudden you've got a colleague that has already done that and could help you do so. So I owe the both of them a phenomenal amount. So the Parks Project, in which I'll talk about, actually has folks uh, from India, China, uh, Spain, and uh, the Netherlands, as well as folks in the United States, that were all working together uh, collaboratively. And this is a project in which we were looking at uh, body composition in mice, really trying to understand what is occurring in beef cattle, in this case for myostatin. And the question that we were interested in, uh, who will trump who, muscle or fat? Because what we had was a genetically obese mouse line that had about the same amount of muscle as a normal mouse, but I mean, gobs and gobs of fat that it would accumulate. And then you had myostatin no lice that essentially have no fat whatsoever in all of the muscle. Uh, Ya Chang uh, was a, a PhD student in my lab at the time. Uh, she grew up in Shanghai. I'm pretty sure her parents were multimillionaires back in the early 2000s, and I'd hate to know how much money they had now, uh, based upon how they took care of us when we went and visited Shanghai. Uh, Satya Rechigani uh, is now a faculty member at the uh, University of Missouri in Columbia. Uh, he grew up in um, uh, the Punjab region in India. Uh, Angela Cannabis is now a faculty member at the University of Guelph, and she's originally from the head of Spain. And Jack Deckers, who is a colleague at Iowa State, but is originally from the Netherlands. And uh, everybody brought something unique uh, to this team in order to be able to answer the question. So I don't think I have to explain what happens in cattle in terms of this point. But the great thing was in mouse is that you could do it. And there was evidence in both cattle and in mice that there were epistatic interactions. So genetic variation at this locus in myostatin interacted with genetic variation somewhere else in the gene that when you brought them together, you got a different phenotype than either one of them alone. And the problem of trying to do this in cattle is you can't generate enough numbers for the most part in order to be able to detect them. Almost everything for genetics is a numbers game. Small numbers, small ability to detect anything. Large numbers, much better but you may still have a small ability to do that. So we had switched to, and we're using the mice in this case. So we had C57 black six. They were myostatin null that were mated as males or females to the M16. And these were the genetically obese uh, mice. And these mice were actually generated at the University of Nebraska. And then we reciprocal cross where we had males to the myostatin null. So we had sex inter, uh, interactions that could occur, as well as genotype interactions, generated uh, heterozygotes, and then went to F2, and essentially got the numbers in terms of trying to do it for equal numbers, both in this cross and here, and then spread for the genetics across. This is just trying to look at the numbers of QTLs in which we detected. And body weight was easily the easiest one in terms of trying to detect uh, pieces. And pretty much as we expected, all of the vast majority of the things were either additive or dominance. As soon as you started to get after epistatic interactions or any interactions, the numbers went down. And we also had worked out a way which we hadn't thought about at the beginning in order to try to get to imprinted genes as well. But there are very few of those that were actually there. Um, and then 
Uh, the number of DQTL is actually not very large. I've got another project I'll talk about later. And the reason why this isn't large, we really just had a few genes in total that we did QPCR on. It's not like we used uh, uh, next generation sequencing in terms of doing the entire transcript on the way we are today. Because when we ran this project, we didn't have the opportunity to even do that. Did this today, I do it all. For any of the QTL in which we looked at, in this case, we start with uh, body weight at week one, two, three, four, five, six, and then average daily gain uh, for different intervals as well, and then between uh, different portions. For the vast majority of it, all right, the variation that you could have for the main effects, they generally were larger, and this is just the average QTL effect that we were detecting versus when you got to the variation for the epistatic interactions, they're dramatically small, which is not unexpected. We didn't expect them to be the same size. Uh, but prior to doing that, no, uh, we did not actually know what they were going to be. Uh, to give you an example of what this was, because at the time when we did this, we were still using SNP markers, but there were only a few of them across the genome. We only had 400 and some markers total. Versus today, if I do this experiment, I'd probably be doing for half a million markers. So it's a much different in terms of the resolution. But an example in this case for average daily gain, there's probably two different QTL that are have an effect because if you have the myostatin null, you don't see it. But now you only see it when you are a myostatin wild type in terms of having the effect. And then this one here, there's a good chance that there's two here as well for average daily gain. But the exact opposite. You only see it in animals that are myostats and all. So it depends on the genetic background. And then we've seen similar things for others for average daily gain, but in this case, by the cross, depending on whether you got the allele from your mother or your father in terms of having an effect. And these actually had probably the larger effects in terms of doing it. So a sex interaction effect was greater than the myostatin interaction that we had seen as well. So one of the genes in which we did gene expression on uh, was ATP 2A2. And this is a fast twitch of protein that is there. So we have the gene expression for it. We knew that myostatin, because the main effect of myostatin was there in terms of having an effect, because myostatin by its very nature will move things to more of a fast twitch than slow twitch. And then ultimately, we identified two other loci, one on chromosome three and another on chromosome X, that also, in this case, appeared to have an effect, but only depending on when you had myostatin was present in the type that you had. So all of a sudden, now we have an effect on a gene expression, which is a phenotype, which we know is going to be impacted by myostatin. But now we have two different modifiers directly to it. Now, we've never been able to go to the point of identifying what is the gene that is actually in those locations to say what is the effect, other than the fact that we know that there's variation there that can move forward. So I've switched now that we'll stick with India, but now we bring in Sri Lanka down here at the bottom of Romania. And uh, for this one, I think this was Belgium, if I remember. Yes. So if you remember when I had talked to Suleiman, First scientist who contacted me was Vishnu Mishra. Uh, today, he is a director of the National Bureau for Animal Genetic Resources in India, which is in Karnal, just north of Delhi. Uh, the research institute has about uh, 50 research scientists at it, and they do all of the genetic variation uh, for really any species for livestock or aquaculture uh, in the nation. And he is an awesome friend today. And we have a wonderful joy every time we get a chance. Uh, Dinesh was a colleague of Vishnu's who came uh, a couple of years later. Ranjit was also a colleague of uh, Vishnu's who has come to my uh, research lab now two different times uh, for training. We had the ability in this project to work with uh, Michelle George. And if anyone's in genetics, and it's a name that probably everybody knows. Uh, that he is one, and then he has a cra crazy scientist, uh, Winter Kubadiers, who is a phenomenal data person. You name it in a computer, he's going to be able to do it. Rohan Fernando, 
he understands mathematics in a way that my biological brain never will. And I've had some of the most insightful conversations with Rohan in the time because he tries to understand for me, how do I understand biology so easy? I try to understand how he understands math so easy, but taking both things together uh, is possible. And then Radu, uh, today he works for Corteva on uh, corn side, uh, but he did the vast majority of the work here. And in this case, we were looking at dwarfism in American Angus. And for a project in my career at Iowa State, to me, this has been the most fun in which it is that I've had, both from a scientific standpoint of saying, what is the impact and what is the mechanism that's taking place here, but also then the impact to the industry. This has probably been also the most uh, learning experience when it comes to politics of animal breeding genetics when working directly with producers that I've had, because I can tell you, I ended up you know, almost having to go to court over all of this project in terms of, thankfully, it never got there. So what we ended up having is a producer in uh, Western uh, Washington, who all of a sudden uh, had this cat, that's uh, the mother, uh, that just never really grew. And you look at the calf in terms of doing it, Head size, almost exactly the same between the mother and the daughter in this case. The rest of the body, about 70, 75% in terms of the size. And uh, the producer, for the most part, I will give them great credit that they started asking questions about it. Because the vast majority of producers would have knocked the head, the head in the head, cat in the head, buried it, and never told anyone about it. But they couldn't do it because all of a sudden some other calves on another ranch were born and the word got out. Uh, they donated so that the calf and the cow actually came to Iowa State, uh, which was also extremely beneficial uh, for this. And we used it as a donation for them uh, donating to the university. So here's a size, and these were calves that we generated. So we superovulated the dam as well as the calf mating back to the sire that generated the uh, calf, affected calf. So it was the same cross <laughs> as what generated calf before. And these are from seven month old calves that we had generated as part of that. And you can see the sheer size and difference of the long bones that were there. Uh, and that also translated, in, when you look at the size of the vertebra, were also much smaller. So we knew we were dealing with something that is occurring at the growth <laughs> terms of doing it, because when you look at the ossification of the bones themselves, they just started to ossify a lot sooner than uh, the wild type or the heterozygotes. So when we were talking to the breeder in terms of the, doing this, he's like, I don't know how in the world I have this defect. I don't have any inbreeding taking place in my herd whatsoever. Uh, so this was uh, the dam uh, in terms of calf all of the calves, and we were able to collect a few normals uh, from her as well as the affected. And every way you look at, there are more loops. I just denote one of them here coming back to this sire. And originally, when we started the project, that sire was what everybody was definitely afraid of. Because at the time when we got these samples, there were 52,000 offspring that had been registered from that uh, sire. Today, 52,000 is nothing. <laughs> They're well past that in terms of doing it, but you could effectively find, and when we calculated inbreeding on these, the lowest number I think was 12 and a half percent inbreeding in all of the calves in which we had. So he had a lot more inbreeding than what he was uh, thinking that he actually had. And we were able to assemble this entire pedigree in order to start to genotype it. And uh, we were able to get uh, back from her a couple of generations. And what we stopped with was a dam who had been uh, super ovulated. Uh, she had 75 progeny that had been registered from her. 
and we ultimately got sample of blood from her one week before she went to slaughter is how close we had on her and then her sire we were able to get dna from him uh because he was sure but shown if anyone's in angus you probably have heard that name uh because he had something like 100,000 offspring registered from him as well we were never able to prove that it was Sherbrooke Shoshone. I have a belief that he was actually a mosaic, that he had a small number of his testicle cells that actually did carry the defect. But we could never get a clean assay in order to show that correctly in terms of blood. So uh, one day, Ledu, uh, who was a postdoc at the time, came right to the office because we'd been going through a candidate region approach based upon human and other species and all of a sudden we had a region that went above a lot score and they were using a peeling algorithm which i cannot explain to you whatsoever it's great to have smart, smart colleagues that all of a sudden it's like all right this looks like this is probably the region in which it is and we've gone through i think three other chromosomes prior to this before this one showed up and um Wouter, and Michelle George had been doing the genotype thing for us. So we actually had to get samples to the in order to do the genotyping for this project. Ultimately, we tried a gene limbin. This is where uh, it could also where um, Vishnu comes in, that he wanted some training in molecular genetics. So we tried a candidate gene approach because it was in this region that we had. Uh, for limbin, which is responsible for dwarfism in uh, Dexter cattle uh, and in Japanese, or sorry, Japanese brown. And ultimately, when we did it, you know, everything we had was wild type for it. So we ended up saturating the region with a number of different uh, microsatellites in the region. And okay, now limbin is down here. It is not in the region so we're just progressively getting smaller and smaller and then ultimately we identified by doing resequencing on the candidate genes some SNPs in the region and all of a sudden we ended up with a uh, transition SNP which essentially introduced a stop program directly into uh, PRKG2 and we really stopped at this point because there was knockout mouse but guess what it was a dwarf in mice in terms of doing so we took this project all the way from all right we have a few animals we can get it down to now the molecular cause of doing this and then learn the politics in terms of how at this at this point in the angus breed they literally it was a black ball mentality any genetic defect that shows up black ball all of those genetics so the producer who gave us the cow he lost his entire operation because no one would buy the genetics from him. He could not uh, operate as a purebred producer, unfortunately, going forward. And we had collected a whole bunch of other samples from his his uh, um, herder. We had developed a way using that healing algorithm that I tell, told you about before that would predict the probability that it was a carrier or not. And you could pretty much put the animals into no, not a carrier, or yep, a great probability. And that drove uh, producers crazy because they didn't want to deal with probabilities. They wanted it black and white in terms of doing it. We had done genotyping for, and so the producer could say, we're pretty sure it's clear, but can't tell it's completely. And then ultimately, we had this uh, variant, and we said, now you can manage it. And they didn't want to manage it because you have to think more about what is the breeding and everything else you did. One year later, there was a genetic defect that showed up in a bull with 75,000 offspring. It changed very quickly in what was the policy for the association in using it. Today, they manage the genetic defects in which they have by physically doing it. But it tells you a lot about trying to convince people. And at one point in a uh, association board meeting, gave a presentation, did all of this. I walked out, one of the producers that was there became great friends with him. And someone asked, who in the world was that? He stood up and goes, oh, that's the janitor. We just asked him to talk about this. And it was like, all right, 
but he brought a little levity to their discussion because it was very intense at that point. Um, so it was very easy to see in terms of that. Uh, so we'll switch now. And now this is more geared towards education of students predominantly uh, coming from Brazil, as well as Iran, and then some wonderful colleagues from New Zealand. Uh, Dorian Garrick uh, was the Lush and Dow chair at Iowa State, so the first person there. I owe a phenomenal amount of my understanding of genetics to him. While I am a professor in animal breeding and genetics, how many genetics classes do you think I've had in my lifetime? Anybody, throw out a number. Two, three. I think I already told you about this story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that, but literally it's two as an undergraduate. So my entire career, I've been essentially working on something in which I only had those classes in it as an undergraduate, which is fine. But Dorian has helped phenomenally in terms of that. Uh, Elaine Cesar was the first graduate student from Brazil who came to my lab. And then uh, Gabriel, uh, Gabriela, Pollyanna, and Priscilla, all came from the same research group in Brazil uh, subsequently. Uh, Hamid Bai is from Iran, probably the smartest computer person in which I have ever interacted with. No matter what it is on the computer for programming or doing or the size of the computer, he will find a way to do it. Uh, he will change things to where the computer folks are like, uh, we can't do it that way. But let's remodify the computer in order to help him try to do what it is. Uh, Louise and Luciana uh, were the major professors for all of the graduate students that are here. And this has been, uh, with folks from Brazil, phenomenal relationship. I think we probably have 35, 40 different publications over the years together. Uh, get together every so often, both in the United States and internationally and in Brazil. Have a lot of fun as well as talk about a lot of science. And in this case, uh, we're now trying to look at uh, transcription factors associated with intermuscular fat. So we started working with fat composition years ago, and this one actually took it a little bit further. Uh, we were working with Nalori bulls. You're not gonna find many of them in the United States, other way, way down in the South. Uh, in terms of the, we had a fair number of SNPs, but then we did RNA seq on a skeletal muscle from all of those animals, and we had back fat, intermuscular fat, and then the fatty acid composition data on all of them. And this was building upon a different project in which I had in my lab where we'd done the same thing, but in uh, American Angus uh, cattle. So this is very simple in terms of okay, here's all of the cattle chromosomes base pair from zero up to whatever it is in the genome. Each black dot represents that there is a variant there controlling some gene. I'm not even trying to show where that is. So these are all trans effects. So this on chromosome 17 may be affecting a gene that's actually expressed over in chromosome two in terms of doing it. Versus those that are on the diagonal, in this case, all right, the SNP is there, the gene is there. So it's pretty easy to say, okay, they're probably a direct effect to it. But how you get from this one over to there to be determined, and at the time when we were doing this, there really wasn't a lot uh, that was out there. Um, and I actually can't remember the total number of associations that we found here uh, for doing this. What we noticed is that there were some hot spots. So like here on chromosome three, there were roughly about 140 genes that were regulated by the variant in that location. They may have been somewhere else. And then on chromosome 11 and 14, so 11 was the largest at almost 160. But when you did a statistical test, these few were way out there. They had everything way past anybody else. So we started trying to dig this in and to understand mechanism for this. And this is where uh, Alini, she dug and dug and dug in terms of trying to find stuff. And then Hamid would go try and do all the statistics associated with it. And ultimately what they 
came downward in those three in which I showed you is that they were able to find transcription factors in each one of those places. And what they were able to show is that all of the genes in which it is that they had as an association to it had one of those transcription factors then and their promoter directly. So we believe that the variant would actually be in each of these three. And then when it bound to uh, the gene itself, it was either more effective or less effective in terms of turning on transcription at that location in order to say, how do we have these trans effects that are there? They went on to show that you could then have uh, different uh, biological effects. And here were the genes associated directly with that. And in the case of fatty acid synthesis, you went all the way back to the biological genes that were actually located there in terms of trying to say, here's how and why we have a change in this location in this phenotype itself. Uh, using data from really only 192 animals at that point in time. So we search now and go to Argentina, Iran, as well as China, and of course, those of us back in uh, the United States. And for this project, it's really now that is actually ongoing. So it is the FANG project, so functional annotation of livestock genomes. In this case, it, um, I'll talk about some of the work we've done with the bovine genome. Amid, uh, again, tried to break computers <laughs> in terms of putting things together and identifying things. That's the majority of everybody else that is on here was all in sample collection in terms of trying to pull or assay development in order to bring things together. But Hamid was the one who was really trying to integrate all of this data together. <laughs> and it is a joy to work with this many people. So one of the things in which we wanted to do is to have really the most detailed transcriptome that we could across the tissues that we had, there were 50 different tissues. And ultimately, we were able to put together over 300,000, 385,000 transcripts in cattle, which is more than double of what you can find in any database today that was there. Um, Roughly splitting them across uh, coding and non coding components to it. And you could break it down into each different piece that you were interested in physically looking at. One of the things, and this goes back to a project which I've not even talked about now, is the QTL database. So if anyone's been to Animal QTL TV and looked at all of the associations and the different livestock that are there, that's a project in which my lab's been doing for a couple decades now. One of the things which I've always been interested in doing is to say, you take the associations and begin to put together molecular networks to begin to explain variation of how trait A is related to trait B. And we thought with this data, we could actually start to get at that. So what we started with is saying, okay, for every TTL, every association in the database for cattle, which I think there's a hundred and some thousand associations that are there across uh, almost 300 different traits in total. Uh, what we always had before was, okay, you have a genetic, you have a SNP or a microsatellite that would mark where that was. Well, you're pretty sure that that's not the causal. So what we did in this case is take every SNP we have and what is the closest gene to it? So that gene may be 10 base pairs away. That gene may be 100,000 or a million base pairs away, but it's the closest one to it. And we made an assumption that that gene is potentially causal or involved in this. You can put as many holes in that hypothesis as you ever want, but it was just an assumption that we made. Then what we did is across all of the different traits to say, to what extent do those now gene lists Overlap, and do you see an overlap of those gene names uh, at a greater frequency than what you'd expect by just pure random chance? Because if they were not associated at all, you'd expect two completely independent. And as they start to overlap more and more and more, all right, there's a good probability that there is now a molecular mechanism behind why these traits could be together 
So you essentially just end up using a simple uh, test in terms of for chi squared for doing the analysis. Nothing complicated, but you have to have all of the data uh, put together. And ultimately, what we ended up finding is that there are lots of genes that you can have associated with different traits uh, after correcting even for multiple testing at a much higher level than what we would have expected by random chance. And then by putting this all together for the different traits, what we were able to do is literally produce a trait by trait matrix now. So take P deficiency, which is a combination of the intake, weight gain, and other components to it. And sure enough, while you can't see it in here, they are all right next to each other, all contained in a biological fashion, which it is a good life. So for putting this trait to trait matrix together, which is what you'd have for a genetic relationship matrix on the genetic side, we did it using absolutely no genetics other than there was an association in the genome in order to put it together. And I believe that you can now take this and begin to tie it back to gene expression and other things to put more of a marker mechanism uh, to it. This has been uh, much easier to do than to try to explain it to the reviewers because they're like, well, that's not right. That violates this assumption. That violates it. Yeah, but it still ends up with the facts in which you know for the relationship should actually be there. Uh, so we've actually had a challenge in terms of trying to get this data published uh, for going forward. So this is the same picture in which I've been showing you throughout, but what I'll point out now are all of these little pins that have been put in place of all of the different scientists or folks who have come to the lab over the years. So I've had 38 different scientists and graduate students who have come to the lab who just want to learn something. Uh, in terms of a technique. But effectively, in everything, they learn something, but they also, in essence, become friends for a lifelong uh, for moving forward. And I've had the opportunity uh, to visit a large number of these places because of essentially saying yes when it started with Vishnu in terms of going forward. And this is actually my immediate family. It has nothing to do with science whatsoever. But what I put out here is in terms of, are we training the next generation of people, the skills, and I put down big data in terms of doing it, because that's really what everybody came to the lab to do. It really wasn't necessarily the lab technique, but how to analyze the data is why they came. And are we passing that on to enough people in terms of what it was that I had for my own research lab? I did large number of graduate students and others, it was great. But by bringing in scientists from elsewhere in the world, I could let my students interact uh, internationally and get exposed to things that they would otherwise not be able to do. And at the same point, then those scientists were also learning all of the things that we were doing in a way that it couldn't necessarily relay just in publications alone. So it's been very much a win-win. Had the opportunity to see the pyramids. Uh, writing camels is a bit Odd. It's not like writing a horse in any manner. The prettiest thing I have probably ever seen in my life, and these are, that's a peak in the Himalayas that I think was somewhere around 25,000 feet. But in the morning, every morning, the first light that will hit it is red light because it bends more than white light. So you've got this nice glow on top of it. And then eventually the white light will hit it, and it literally looks like you put a diamond on top of it. Now you got to wake up very early in the morning in order to see it, but it's probably the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life, and it happens every day, assuming it's not cloudy. Uh, Taj Mahal, I don't even know how to explain that place. It is phenomenal. And then uh, before, it uh, burned down on uh, Notre Dame. Probably looks a little bit strong. A little bit different today. In all of this, I also had the opportunity to go on a sabbatical. So I went to the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, which is just south of Cambridge, for one year. Any faculty member here 
go on a sabbatical every time in which you can go on a sabbatical, assuming you can make it financially viable to do it. You can learn so much. Uh, this would be uh, my two boys. Uh, they were a little bit younger back then. They were nine and 11 at the time. They're now 25 and 27 uh, in terms of doing it. And if you've ever been to Cambridge for punting on the can, lots of fun. Uh, invariably, though, someone's going to fall off the boat and end up in the water a little bit wet. Uh, let's see. Nicholas here, he did the greatest feat where he had people one day that were all applauding him when we came in, because somehow the punt got stuck, he held on to it and then used it as a pole vault to get over to the shore. And there happened to be a post there that he could grab himself up and he only got one toe wet. And literally everybody was applauding. But it's because of collaborations that this was possible as well. In all of this, I have to thank my wife, phenomenal lady, because she was willing to, in many respects, stay home when I was off seeing many of these things, but also have had the opportunity to bring her along. And if anyone comes to supper tonight, you can meet her. She's the better half in terms of doing everything, but absolutely phenomenal. Our first trip when we went to India, she got the henna put on her hands. And I'd been talking all morning with the scientist at MBGAR. And all of a sudden we get a phone call and like, we gotta go pick your wife up, she can't come anymore and it's like i knew she had gotten on the motorcycle and gone with a friend's wife down to the um uh bazaar in order to go shopping but they wouldn't say why we she couldn't make it back and then all of a sudden she showed up like this and she's like you have to feed me because i can't use my hands <laughs> you know, like her butt, which is absolutely phenomenal um let's back up a little uh challenges in terms of working internationally. Um, there are there. A lot of it comes to language and understanding each other. Now, everybody in which came, uh, they are all remarkably smarter than I because everybody knew multiple languages in terms of doing it. I can speak a smattering of Spanish and Portuguese and uh german and dutch but i can't speak in order to have a conversation in any one every scientist who has come has been able to speak multiple languages and they've also then conferred in terms of here's different cultural differences and we had to be uh, cognizant of a lot of that my lab is a beef cattle genetics lab the vast majority of the scientists coming from india can't do anything with beef cattle so we had to find unique ways in terms of being able to allow them to do the science in which it is that they wanted to do without being able to uh, have an impact on the religion in which it is that they have. They also, because of my brain, many brain, uh, decades ago, only ever thought about feeding everybody beef or pork in Iowa. Well, guess what? Most of the Indians do not eat meet in any matter. So all of a sudden changed and learned. It's like, all right, I have to think to that to a greater extent than what my uh, upbringing was. The benefits way outweigh any of the consequences. That said, I would also say in the last five years, it is much harder today to host international science. And it has nothing to do with the science. It has everything to do with the compliance that you have to do in order to say, can we physically work with scientists in a given region because of competition that you have internationally? So over the years, I've had numerous folks from China. I don't know if I'll ever have another Chinese scientist ever visit my lab again because of the complications of getting a visa. Uh, Hamid, who I talked about for doing the computation. And this is a lesson in, for any graduate student, a lesson in tenacity. If you can do something like this, I would hire you in any day. So he grew up in Iran. There is no embassy, no consulate for the US in Iran. To get a visa, he literally had to leave the country and find a country that he could get to in order to get to a US embassy or consulate in order to get um, a visa. And when he told me that he had, I was like, 
absolutely no problem. You can come, I will pay you for whatever. It was the greatest thing because he found a way literally to get money out of Iran to Armenia in order to pay for the visa, get there, have the um, interview, as well as then get back to Iran in terms of doing it. He is now, uh, has his green card in the US and he just accepted a position with uh, Pfizer in up, uh, upstate New York in terms of doing bioinformatics, but one of the most tenacious people in the world. The other, and I, I can't say whether this is the case or not, but he literally uh, tells me, I saved his life. I gave you an opportunity. He's like, yeah, but I wasn't at home for all of the riots and everything else because he had other family members recently who have perished because of these. So it has impact. Uh, that said, I think that's everything which I can, uh, other than to try to thank every single person who is on it. And this is not even close to everybody in which I've ever collaborated in my life, but these are the folks that have been involved in at least one of the projects in which I talked about, and for many of them, a vast majority of the projects that are there as well. So what questions do folks have? Sun silence. Anybody? We're all gonna hide. <laughs> what would you? Okay, How do you select your international students? Uh, pretty much, for the for the most part, vast majority of them have come from colleagues in which I had started to work with. So for Brazil, uh, Luciana and Luis, I had worked with them because Lucy, uh, Luis uh, was a postdoc at USDA and I met him and started collaborating with him there. Luis, uh, uh, Luciana, sorry, had come to Iowa State and had visited and had met her there. So I knew a personal relationship for all of them. Uh, for the graduate students that came out of Egypt, uh, there was another faculty member in the department that they knew who knew the student. Uh, Hamid would be the one where it had no time whatsoever uh, in terms of doing it. But uh, as I said, anybody was tenacious enough to do that, I'm willing to accept because they're going to find a way in order to get things done. Uh, scientist, uh, I started with Vishnu. Uh, and again, it was, we don't know. Uh, we think, and it was just a chance that was taken. But then, really, everybody else that has come from India, Vishnu knew them personally in terms of saying, yeah, this is a good person uh, to work with and others. So, almost all of it relationship based. Vast majority. And that's why I give the credit back to Sue and Max because they helped start those relationships. Chris, you had something. Yeah, uh, what would you be your advice for uh, graduate students to expand their networks? Say yes. Even though your brain may be screaming, yeah, no, just do it. Um, walk up and talk to whoever. Start discussing. Because, um, I mean, I can go back. Here, as a graduate student, I think I'd have been terrified to walk up to Michelle. He is one of the most down to earth people in which you will ever know in terms of doing it. It wasn't until I was a faculty member that I ever got to talk to him. And the day in which I first talked to him for the greatest amount of time, uh, Jim Womack, if anybody knows genetics at all, unfortunately, he just passed away. Uh, he had won the Wolf Prize, which is one step below uh, Nobel. Um, Harris Lewin, uh, so Jim and Harris, both National Academy of Science members. Uh, Michelle is as well now, subsequently. 
and one other person were going to go out for drinks. And Michelle was like, come on. And at that point, I think I've been a faculty member for two years in terms of doing it, but got introduced to Michelle by Max in terms of just breaking the ice in terms of doing it. They're all human in terms of doing it. Some are a little bit easier to work with than others, as they're most humans. But just say yes and go try and talk to someone. They'll probably say yes. What else? Why a bunch? I'm here for everybody else. <clears throat> I can ask you questions too. If there are no questions, um, Dr. Reese will be in 138 for lunch with the yeah. graduate students. I look forward to that. So you'll have more time to talk with them then yeah, if you don't want to ask questions now. Um, but otherwise, uh, let's thank Dr. Reese again. Thank you. Thank you, buddy.